coming up on Chopper's political podcast. And you're 71? 71. So you've got nine years... Thank, thank, thank you for well, pointing that out. Well, I'm going to say it because you've got nine years left before you're chucked out. Welcome back to Chopper's Political Podcast, where I bring you the best guests, gossip and stories from the heart of Westminster. Sir Keir Starmer is the new UK Prime Minister, Labour's in government after 14 years of Tory rule. During the campaign, we've heard about how the Labour Party will go back to tackling and making tough decisions, notably on law and order, crime and and obviously, and right now, in front and centre for the government, on prison reform. I want to talk about law and order and and how why people go to prison and, and what the, whether that works with somebody who knows a lot about it, not least because we have in Sir Keir Starmer, a former director of public prosecutions. And who better to ask than his predecessor, Ken MacDonald, Lord MacDonald of River Glaven, of Clay Next to Sea in the county of Norfolk, to give you your full title. <laughs> okay, Ke- right. Ken MacDonald, <laughs> welcome to Chopper's Political Podcast. Did you ever know uh, Keir Starmer? Of course, I, I, I knew him at the bar. I've known him 30 years or more. I mean, he was, he was Keir wasn't a criminal lawyer. He was a public lawyer. He did some criminal cases, but he was basically a public lawyer, which means that he brought challenges to the government um, in relation to government policy and argued for the human rights of his clients and so on. Um, but I knew him... Uh, at the bar as a kind of kindred spirit. I mean, his chambers and my chambers did a lot of work together. He was at Doughty Street, I was at Matrix. So yes, I I, I knew him quite well as a lawyer. Um, Mm. That was my relationship with him. When you say a public lawyer, that's quite interesting because that that means you have to convince judges of a case, not a jury. And some some would say that was what made him different to, say, Tony Blair, who had to convince convince juries of things. Is Is that... Does that say a bit about him as a person? Yeah, I I think it does. Actually, Tony didn't have to persuade juries. He was an employment lawyer, but he could have persuaded juries if he wanted to. Keir was never really a a jury lawyer. He was a judge lawyer, which is to say he was extremely good at at mastering arguments. He'd master all the evidence, the facts, but he'd know the law. He'd he'd, he'd create a, a really consistent, logical, rational argument, and he'd go through it step by step. He'd explain the law to a judge. He was very good at it. Judges trusted him because he was clever, because he was hardworking, because he didn't cheat. You know, some barristers cheat. They take bad points. They play their, their opponent rather than the ball. Keir never did any of that kind mm. of stuff. He was straight and he was good. But mm. but certainly not a great orator, not a great jury orator. That wasn't his strength. Mm. And he knew it. That wasn't what he was I, I would argue not a great a political orator. I think he learned that during the campaign. Certainly at the beginning of the campaign, I was with him yeah. often on in person for six weeks. He was very wooden and had made it quite difficult, I think, to, to flow. But yeah. by the end... I, I I know this. I was watching his auto cue. He had like just words flashed up to trigger a response yeah. in him, and he became a better better communicator. Yeah, he certainly did. I, I, th- I think the thing, Chris, is that he, he really practices politics the way he practiced law. So you know the, the the five missions, the six steps. I mean, that's how he would plan out a case, and that's how he's planning out his government. We'll see mm. whether that's a good approach in the years to come. And that's changed from the old lot. Well, it, it, is, it is certainly changed from Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah, and Liz Truss. And maybe well, not well, Liz, so Truss had a plan. Was, Liz Truss had a plan. It was just a pretty stupid one. In my yes, opinion. yes. Well, the plan was growth. It's how they went yeah, about yeah, yeah. it was, was yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. But let's, let's not lit- litigate. Let's not the, fall, out, uh, no, no. fall out over Truss. Um, has he got the skill set to be PM? I mean, what, what were your skill set when you were DPP? Well, when you're DPP, I mean, the central task is to make very sensitive decisions under pressure they're going to impact many, many people, not just impact the victim, the defendant, the police officers, but in, impact the public. Because if you don't bring a case that ought to be brought, that damages criminal justice in the uh, public comments in the criminal justice system. If you bring the wrong cases, it has the same effect. So one skill you learn is to, bring, is to make difficult sense of decisions under pressure. The other is to develop a very thick skin because mm. half the population hate a decision you make. If you made the opposite decision, it would simply be the other half of the population mm. that hated you. So you, 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 so, so you, working under pressure, developing a thick skin, and you know, keeping people on board, keeping your staff on board. So I think you do learn some skills. He was a very good DPP mm. here. You remember he was a good DPP. Mm. Uh, and proud of prioritising because often yeah. when you when you decide to, to prosecute, is is it right? There's more than fifty percent chance of of, yeah. of a conviction. Yeah, you, you, the, 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 the test is: is there a realistic prospect of conviction? Which is it essentially means but, more than fifty percent, and is it in the public interest? Which is where his public law skills mm. would come into play very much. Is it in the public interest? And the Tories tried to land blows on him during the campaign, notably, I mean, um, let's talk about the 
know, Jimmy Savile. Yeah. Why was he not prosecuted? And they, and they try to make that. In fact, Boris Johnson actually did try and make that in a, in a yeah. PMQ session, an issue for Sir Keir Starmer. It never quite landed there, though. Mm. And of course, one of Johnson's senior advisers resigned um, as a result of that intervention by the then Prime Minister. I mean, of course, there's a sense in which when you're DPP, you're responsible for everything. If something mm. happens on your watch, in the old fashioned traditional sense, you have to finally take responsibility. But the fact was that that case hadn't gone past over his desk, which is not surprising. I mean, we, we, when I was DPP, we were prosecuting one point million cases a year, and I was, certainly wasn't looking at one point two million cases. So, so you know, you have to mm. rely on people. And in that sense, he wasn't responsible. I think people broadly thought it was a bit of a low blow from Johnson. Yes. And, and coming from Johnson, people weren't necessarily surprised it might be a low blow. And defending unsavoury characters which is the old, I think the cab rank rule, which you might explain yeah, what it is, is understood yeah. now by people. The, the cab rank rule is that, is that lawyers, barristers are not allowed to refuse cases on the grounds that they disapprove of what the client mm. has done or disagree with his political views. And the idea is that everybody deserves legal counsel. Um, and so, he, I, listen, I've represented terrible, terrible people over mm. the years. I've been practising at the bar for over 40 years. I've represented some truly evil people. And I'm not in the least ashamed of it because that's the constitutional role. But you had to believe they, they were innocent, didn't you? That was the, that's the, is that the deal? No, or no, not no, even no, that? No, no, no. It, 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 I mean, this always sounds cynical when you explain it to people. That's not really a consideration. Oh. What happens in a criminal trial is that the prosecution have to prove their case to a certain standard. And the job of the defence is to, is to show that they can't achieve that standard. It's not, and people hate it when I say this, but it's not really about whether the defendant is guilty or innocent. It's about whether the prosecution have enough evidence mm. to prove their case. And so defence lawyers very rarely even think about whether their client is guilty or innocent. There's one important exception to that. If a, if a client tells you that they are guilty, he or she is guilty, you can't then go on to represent them on a not guilty plea. But clients very rarely tell their barristers they're guilty. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. They've got nothing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you were a, a Lib Dem peer, weren't you? And are you your cross bench now? Yes. Um, you, so you're, you're probably pleased with how the Lib Dems did, I guess. I'm, I'm pleased, yeah. I mean, over good, 70 good, MPs. Good on them, good on them yeah. And huge, huge um, majority for the Labour Party. Time for a change? I mean, it feels that way in yeah, the country. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are these moments, aren't, aren't there? You know, 45, 79, 97, and now I think we can add... Uh, 2024. Although I will say this, I mean, people have described this as a, a loveless landslide. I, I don't think it feels the way it felt in 97 or 79 or 45. There's not this huge outpouring of of, no. of <clears throat> optimism and enthusiasm. And I think that's, that, that contains a, a time bomb for Keir. And, mm. and particularly since his strength isn't necessarily the great oratory, the great arts of persuasion, you know, that, that, that contains all sorts of future risks for him, I think. What are, the, are those risks? I mean, what you've got to bring the country f to, towards him. So, let's say 98 of the Labour seats, reform was second, not the yeah, Tory party. Yeah. So he can't, you may want to ignore Nigel Farage, but he does speak for millions of people. I think, I think we've learned <coughs> in, in the recent past that you don't ignore Nigel Farage. He's one of the most consequential mm. political figures of the last... Have you met him? 50 years. I haven't met Nigel Farage. I'd be perfectly happy to meet him. I mean, he's clearly a man with enormous political talents. Mm. I don't agree with his position no. on, on virtually anything, but, you know, one has to admire his political skill. And he's certainly got a future. He, I don't think he's in this for the, the next year or two. And he might get bored, but I think he seriously thinks that he's got a chance to supplant well, the Conservatives as the party of the right. What he's like, and I've covered him since um, 2012. Of course, he's a colleague at GB News off and on. <clears throat> he's someone who, who listens to, to people. I mean, he, when you meet him, meet him for a cup of tea, you know, he wants to sit outside yeah. to have a smoke, but he wants the interaction with the passing traffic. You yeah. yell at him all the time. Yeah. He just He's totally... Yeah. And that connection to what people think makes him so potent. I think a lot of our politicians get hidden, removed from people. Yeah. But I think he he genuinely likes and connects with people, and that makes him dangerous well, I think, in I think, a weird way. Yeah, I think... And, and look at the campaign. I mean, it, it was a fake campaign in many ways. Where were the rallies? Where were the, where were the <coughs> genuine interactions? All we got were... By, by which parties? All of them? All of them. I mean, all, what we got... Although from, Farrell's met people, but... Far, I mean, apart from Farrell's, yeah. I'm talking about, about, about the Lib Dems, the Tories, and the Labour. I mean, mm. Ed Davey fell off a few surfboards. Yeah. Keir and, and, and Rishi, basically, I mean, their rallies were all staged, all those people waving flags behind them. They were employees, party, weren't party they? Of bosses watching so them. I think there's a real danger here that, you know, people feel the political class is divorced to them. The political class sometimes behaves as though it wants to be divorced from the public. And, and that, that give, clearly gives Farage mm. an opportunity. 
I think it might be led by security. I, I of really, course. I really felt that um, Rishi Sunak was was never there. He, he was like a prime minister doing visits, not trying to win support from people. So, on the day that they they um, the inflation fell to two percent, <coughs> he should be in a market with people yeah. benefiting from lower inflation. I mean, do you think, do you we went to a power station. I, I totally agree. And, and put on a yellow jacket and, <coughs> yes. a, and, a, and a, a helmet. And a, I, mean, I mean, do you think it is driven by security or is it a combination of security? Well, and, they, 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 they never control. talk about I asked a question. They, yes. they never, they, they won't talk about security, nor not. should they. Um, um, you know more than I do about that. Yeah. Um, but I just said to them, the problem is you are missing out here. You're, you're running a campaign for the Tory party, certainly, like you're on a prime minister visit. But that's not convincing on to vote for you. And whereas Farage... Yeah. Is making taking risks and getting milkshake for his risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's. I think it's very stark. I think. I think more importantly, people notice it. I don't mm. think people are fooled by it. It, it, it. I mean, one understands the security risks, but I wish we could find a way to, it to increase contact between political leaders and the public that's consistent with their safety. And I, and I suspect <coughs> it's possible, you know. I mean, you, you can screen people, you can have police presence. Or, 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 or just be a bit more, more, just if you're on a, on a battle bus, pull in in Stoke Town Centre, yeah. get out for yeah. 10 minutes, yeah. walk around, yeah. everyone films it, yeah. get back on board when it gets a bit hairy, if yeah. it gets hairy. Yeah. Just yeah. take a bit of a chance. Yeah, I mean, Gordon Brown used to do it. Yeah, he famously met the bigoted woman. <laughs> yeah, didn't he? Yeah. Had to go and apologise to her. Yeah, um, yeah, quite right. But of course, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we, we now have a new government. Um, you, you're someone who knows this area intimately. Um, um, justice. Um, he's appointed James Timpson now. Lord Timpson, a colleague of yours in the House of Lords, as prisons, prisons minister. James Timpson runs the Timpson's shoe chain, employs prisoners, helps with rehabilitation. He says that only thirty percent of prisoners d should definitely be in prison. Now, what does that say to us about the new PM? Yeah, well, this, this is, I think this is really interesting, and I, I think you've touched on something <coughs> important. This, I think this is a tell, actually. Keir Starmer, I mean, I've already talked about the way he practised law and that that's the way he practised his politics. Careful, step by step, thinking ahead, very strategic. There is, in my opinion, there is no way that Keir Starmer would have appointed James Timpson to that role unless he wanted to make progress and, and, and quite radical progress in the in the field of of penal policy. Mm. I mean, the worst possible thing for the government would be if James Timpson in three months resigns because he says nothing's happening. So that yes, normally happens, by the way. Yeah, I know it normally with happens. people like and, James and Timpson, happen, and he may may not happen here. It might happen here, but 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 if but if Keir is appointing him because of what James Timpson represents, which I believe to be the case, that would suggest that Keir is going to be a lot more radical in this area than uh, perhaps the Labour Party suggested during mm. the election. That's interesting in itself. He's thinking the unthinkable, isn't he? Yeah. At the start of, of a landslide yeah, yeah. government. And yeah. that's when you can do it. You have yeah. space You've to do it. You've got the political space to do it. I mean, the, the, the truth is that the, the prisons situation we're in is a, is, a, is a monumental failure of public policy over years. We've been ramping up sentences. We've been reducing remission. We've mm. been tampering with parole. Creating more crimes. Many, many more <laughs> crimes. A lot of them, in my view, unnecessary. Yeah. Exploding prison population, the highest in, in Western Europe, and no new prison places. So we've got a building... Prison. Some, not no... They built some. Okay, so they promised. They promised. They promised twenty thousand by yes. twenty twenty five yes. in twenty twenty. They got. We've got five thousand, yep. and we're going to get the, the full amount. They set full number. They say by uh, twenty thirty. That's the Tory government, yeah. of course. One, yeah. one prison apparently has been delayed because they found a badger set um, yeah. on the site. But, but look, the, the real question is: you know, every single new prison cell costs six hundred and thirty thousand pounds of capital spending. So it's fantastically expensive. They're going to have to ask, do we want prisons or hospitals? Do we want prisons or schools? What's it for, Ken McDonald? What is prison, prison for? Prison is to confine people who are dangerous, in my opinion. That's James, that's James Timpson's view. So James Timpson says, a third of the prisoners are dangerous. We need to be protected from them. A third need therapeutic intervention, addiction intervention, mental health inter interventions in the community. And a third need proper community punishment. So he says two thirds should be out there. And that's actually the model followed in most <coughs> other countries. The question is, whether we want to spend those vast sums of money on new prisons to keep the other two thirds in. A very interesting statistic is that if you take two cohorts of prisoners who have committed the same sorts of offences, one cohort punished in the community through community service and so on, the other punished in prison, those who come out of prison have a higher recidivism, recidivism rate. They reoffend okay, more in. often and more quickly than those who are punished in the community. So it's a double whammy. It's not only more expensive, mm. it's less efficient. And I think Keir Starmer, I think that what he's thinking is we need to make some progress to reduce the population and to stop putting people in prison who are a nuisance rather than dangerous. 
big downside risks for him. What if some of these people come out and do something terrible? You know, the mail and other papers will be all over him. It could be an early crisis. He's got no choice, actually, and he's got some cover because he can say, look, I had no choice. The Tories dumped this on me. But it's still a risky policy. I think it's the right policy, mm. but it carries political risk. And he's showing some courage. I think the weekend reporting said it's going to happen in September. They've got to assess these people. Correct. So we'll wait and see how that plays out. The, the Tory party, the King's Speech, of course, is this week. The last King's Speech was a reporting on for GB News. It said there that the government should grasp the nettle of sentencing and not jail anyone for less than a year, didn't they? Yeah, the they, they, term was grasp the nettle yeah, in, in that. In that, the, that was, I mean, in Alex, the Alex, Alex Chalk was the previous Secretary of State. Uh, very good Secretary of State for Justice, in my view. Great loss to Parliament. But he, what he wanted was a presumption that any sentence under 12 months would be suspended. I suspect that those are the sorts of policies that this government might pick up. They might make it any sentence under two years to make it a bit more radical. I think they're going to deal with remission, with remand, have less people held on remand before trial and, and various other kind of tinkering around the edges. Yes. But the real question is, how do we stop sending so many people to prison without yes. social disruption? I'm going to say to, you, say to you the word victims. Yeah. I've been a victim of crime. So have I. OK, you have. Um, uh, you know, in my case, uh, a bus driver killed my wife's mother. My daughter lost a leg. The guy went to prison. Um, so I'm, I know what it's like, to be a, and you've been a victim too. What, what's your? One of my sisters was killed by a, a driver in France. Yeah. So how do you feel if those individuals are released early from prison? I mean, I, I thought I thought about this in my in my own case, and I, and and I have to say, I know everyone reacts differently to these things. For my part, me and my family were not particularly interested in what happened right. to the the Antimarche lorry driver who'd done this. We were more focused on the loss of my sister. And we didn't really... Sorry. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that people who become very invested in, in what happens to the perpetrator are wrong. I'm not saying that at all. For us, it, it wasn't so much of an issue. So I think I, mm. I would say personally, I would be fine with it. But I know that not everybody is, and I respect that. And, and I, I'm the same as you. So we don't even talk about the guy. Yeah, well, he's exactly. not. He has no control of our lives. Exactly. It's happened. We we focus on how to build. Exactly. We build, exactly. and that's we put some shares. That's exactly, exactly, exactly our reaction. But you know, but you, not, and, you but and I have to respect when people take 100%. it differently. And some people, hundred percent. For some people, the entire way they deal with grief is to is to is to secure justice. And if they don't secure mm. justice, it's very very. People bitter. who haven't been through this that we both share do say to me things like, "Don't you want to go?" And you know, yeah. do something awful. And I said, no, I don't even think about the bloke. Yeah. I mean, the, so I think people who haven't been through it think there's a need for kind of retribution yeah. of some sort. Yeah. And I don't feel I that. Didn't, I didn't feel it. I, know, I, I, don't, I don't think... Is that because you rationalised it, maybe? No, it isn't because I rationalised it. It's because I just didn't care. Mm. I cared about what had happened. Um, mm. I cared about... I mean, I remember speaking to a nurse who came to my sister's funeral who'd been looking after this man because he was injured in hospital. And I said to her, what was he like? And she said, in French, and someone had to try to he's a lorry driver. Mm. You know, and I, I didn't want to. I didn't need to know any more than that, really. Mm. Yeah. Having said that, though, there will be cases. I think that the, the political risk. And I'm so sorry about your loss. No, by no, way. And yours as well. Um, yeah. um, but, but putting our personal circumstances to one side, uh, Ken McDonald, there will be people who will be um, very upset to see people who committed a crime leaving leaving prison sooner than they expected. Maybe they might feel unsafe suddenly because they're out quicker. Um, and you may have, um, as you say, they people who, who leave prison may then commit crime when they should be in jail and how will the government manage that yeah well the figures show that presently about 25 percent of adults who leave prison reoffend. um <clears throat> a, a, about closer to 30 percent of of young offenders and no less than 50 percent of adults who are serving short sentences so some of these people will reoffend <clears throat> anyway anyway and, they and, and, and now and now i mean let's forget let's not forget most of the people who are going to be released under this scheme are just going to be released two or three or four weeks early we're not yes. talking about people serving very long sentences in the main because they will have committed more serious offenses but the point about this whole program is and and about the reforms if keir starmer wants to introduce them is that they have to reinvest massively in probation and rehabilitative yeah. services. If they simply release uh, these thousands of people out onto the streets with no supervision, no rehabilitation, it, it'll be a disaster mm. because they'll have nowhere to live, they won't have jobs, they'll go and shoplift, they'll go and buy drugs, and, and we'll have a, a chaotic situation. So we have to have in place a much higher functioning probation service. I mean, you know, if we took some of the £630,000 it, 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 it costs to build each new cell... And put that, that would pay for a lot of probation officers. <laughs> yes. So, and I, and I know that because one of my relatives is a probation officer and I know mm. what he earns. It would pay for a lot of <laughs> probation officers. Good. So I think, I think the answer is that without 
proper probation and support for these people, the government is running a big risk. So they've bought themselves a few weeks' grace, yeah. and can they set up that no, network I in the community? It. I doubt it. I mean, ha I think they have to be quite careful about the, the first cohorts who are released. They'll have to be releasing the ones that they really have some strong faith in. The, the, the Shabana Mahmood has announced that they're going to recruit a, another thousand probation officers, but that's by April of next year, yeah. so that's going to be slow. And query whether a thousand is going to be enough. I mean, Keir, when he was campaigning, was always railing against sticking plaster policies and he's got to be careful this is not a sticking plaster policy but if this, is, this is going to buy 18 months this will releasing these people releasing these people will buy 18 months of extra prison capacity no more so on its own that's a sticking plaster well, the way it'll work though is, is you'll be released after we think we don't know this for sure but we think it's going to be something like 40 yeah. percent of time served yeah. rather than 50 percent of time served yeah and that'll be across the board going uh, ad infinitum for certain types of offenses I mean, for, for, for largely non-violent offences, not for sex offences, not for domestic abusers, uh, not, not for the more serious offences. Mm. So we're talking about prisoners at the lower end of the scale, yeah. the sort of people who, under a Dutch system or a German system, probably wouldn't, and under a, a yeah. James Timpson system, wouldn't have been sent to prison in the first place. Because they're not at risk to other people. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, not especially. You, 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 of course, not, not especially. You've been talking to the National Prisoners, Prisoner Officers Association. Are they in favour of this? They're, yeah. they're the people looking after these. I did a, I did a, we did an episode of Double Jeopardy, my Law and Politics podcast, just to get in another plug there. Thank you, yes. Yeah, um, yesterday with Mark Fer, Fer, Fairhurst, who's the chair of the Prison Officers Association. Great guy. We, we interviewed him a couple of months ago as well. He's completely in favour of this. He, he rates Timpson. Um, I mean, you know, everyone thinks prison officers, they'll just want to bang everyone up and throw away the key. Not true no. at all. You know, there's a lot of really smart people working in the prison service. And Mark's view, I mean, Mark says, you know, Mark always says, all the penal reformers hate me, but I'm more in favour of penal reform than they are. Mm. He, he thinks there are too many people in prison. He thinks there are too many people of the wrong type in prison. In other words, people who aren't really dangerous. But he, he queries whether the government are going to be prepared to spend what is necessary on probation to make this policy mm. work. So that's his worry. They've got political space for the yeah. early release scheme, yeah. it seems. Yeah. But have they, are they prepared yeah. for what's going to happen? Well, having the POA on board is pretty, yeah. pretty, a pretty big win. And actually. judges too. I think judges... Yeah, well, by and large, I mean, they, 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 that's true. I mean, we set so, up... So this... what, what I say that because if judges start saying, I wish I, I wish I could jail you, but I can't because of Labour, that kind of comment yeah. will be a problem in, in the front yeah, page of the Daily yeah. Mail or I mean, on GB News. I mean, judges, you know, we've had this thing called the Sentencing Council since 2003. Yeah. I was a member of it, and it, mm. it's supposed to send out... Well, it does send out guidelines for judges for, you know, uh, length of prison in, in particular types of offences. And, and the idea of that in 2003 um, was to try and bring about a reduction... Uh, in the in, in, in the number of prisons. It didn't really work. In fact, some academics think it's that, that setting out guidelines has had the effect of ramping up the number of prisoners because judges no longer feel they can step outside and give someone a break mm. as easily as they could in the past. So, you know, judicial culture is, a, is another thing that's a big problem. It's a particular problem for politicians because judges don't want to be influenced by politicians. That's, no. a, that's an article of faith for them. They do not like political interference. So if Keir Starmer makes a speech and says, I want judges to send people to prison for less. He's going to have a very angry Lady Chief Justice on the phone to him. Yeah, but, the, but the judges weren't, because the politicians were, were not doing dealing with this problem, the judges were saying, weren't they? I think they were giving, giving they were saying you can't jail people, weren't they? Was, well, there were, there, there, listen, most people in criminal justice, prof professionals in criminal justice, if you ask them, would say that our prison population is too high. You know, I mean, Germany, almost a, a, a half less than us. France a third less than us, Scandinavian countries more than half less than us. I don't think British people are nastier or more violent or more unreasonable mm. than Germans, French people or Dutch people. It's just that we make the decision to send a higher proportion of defendants to prison and we have to justify that decision. We have to justify it on grounds of expense. We have to justify it on grounds of effectiveness and I think it falls down on both. So should the should the, the debate be changed? Do you think should we have a different conversation about who we're jailing? And maybe that's yeah. what Timpson's doing. I think I think that I think that's. Ex that, I mean, I'm making I'm going to make a speech during this King speech debates, in the in the in the, in the House of Lords, and that's what I'm. You've, you've actually stolen my line. That's yes. what I'm going to be saying. I think, and I think that's what Keir Starmer. Look, look, if Keir Starmer didn't want to change the debate, he wouldn't have appointed James Timpson. He is to got more prisons, though, isn't he? Yeah. So he's doing one thing. He's doing one thing. More more prison places, but we're going to change the debate. Yeah. At the we same need time. We, we, even even if we change the debate, we need new prisons because our old prisons are just appalling. I have mm. a friend whose son is, is, is in the graduate prisoner entry scheme, I think it's called Unlocked, and he's at a, a central London Victorian prison and he tells, I mean, extraordinary stories about the state of that prison. So we need new prisons anyway, if only to replace the old ones. So what are your plans now then, uh, Lord MacDonald, over the next, next 
next few weeks and months? I mean, you've got a new government in there. You sound quite able to communicate and talk to them on their own issues here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly would... would I, I think I'll probably spend more time in, in Parliament than I have in recent years. I'm a crossbencher. I do mm. other things. I'm, 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 che- I'm president of the Howard League for Penal I Reform, saw that, yes. which also has an interest in this. And I chair the Orwell Foundation, which gives Britain's leading prizes for journalism and political writing. I, you, you I should enter it. You should enter that sometime. <laughs> we, just had our, we just had our prize ceremony a, a couple of weeks ago. And I, that, I, do, I do various... I practice law still in yeah. the chambers, so I'm quite busy. But I think I will rebalance a bit in favour of Parliament. You know, it's exciting having a new government. I, I was appointed the laws in 2010, so I've never had yes. uh, a, a government of the centre-left. Um, so it's interesting for me because yes. I'm broadly on the centre-left and uh, I think I'm going to find it quite exciting. Yes, it will. I mean, it, it, the issues are the same, but the people are new and that, that yeah. gives us all a degree of optimism that it might work out. We, might, all, want, we all want yeah. to improve it. Yeah, well, there's always a honeymoon period. The question usually is how long, how long does yes. it last? I mean, I mean, Blair's honeymoon period worked for a, a term and a half. I mean, It really know, did, he, yeah. He got two landslides, not just one, and the third, the third win was a pretty big one. So... Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just think the situation is more difficult now. Politics is more fractured. Party loyalty is much lower than it was. And I mm. think, you know, Keir, Keir's got a tough task. And you're 71? 71. So you've got nine years... Thank, thank, thank you for well, pointing that out. Well, I'm going to say it because you've got nine years left before you're chucked out. That's not quite true, actually, because what they're saying is you, you retire at the end of the Parliament to oh. achieve, achieve the age of 80, so it could be 85. <laughs> actually, I, I, I noticed with some interest that they announced a couple of days ago that they're not going to move immediately to that. They're going to put it out to consultation. They are going to move immediately to removing the hereditaries, but they're going to yeah, move to 80 or so hereditaries, 79 hereditaries. Yeah, I mean, there are, there, are, there are a lot of people in the Lords over 80 who are very significant contributors. I mean, yeah. from the Labour point of view. Alf Dubbs. Alf Dubbs. Goodness, Alf Lord Dubbs. Winston. Alf Dubbs is 91. You know, yeah, he came he, to Britain on a kinder transport. He's a wonderful Total legend. Person. And, and, and the, the, peer, the Labour Party love him. And, you know, telling him he's got to retire... That's going to be a difficult phone call for Keir. Well, it is. And we asked uh, Sir Keir Starmer about this very point on, on the flight over to uh, the NATO summit I went to last week with GB News. I mean, you look at, you know, Joe Biden's 80, 81. Is he, is he passed it? And, of course, then he, he dodged that question. Well, Sir he Keir to, didn't he? I mean, pretty, 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 pretty <laughs> impolitic not to. I mean, you know, I mean, that's just a ludicrous situation, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. I mean, and where, how I, mean, I couldn't watch. Out. I couldn't watch the debate. It was, I, I watched about oh, two mm. minutes when it was just, it was, it was like, it was cruel to watch it. Wasn't it, it was. And it, I mean, I, I have an elderly parent. I lost my dad very recently. Oh, and I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah. But when you, you, you want to protect someone who's elderly from, from scrutiny, basically. It's his family that I don't... I, don't I, I can't accept, accept what they're doing. Because yeah, I mean, then they should be saying to him, come on, come Joe. On Joe. You, you know, you, I mean, depending on your point of view, I think he's had a good first term. I think he's been a good president. He beat Trump. He goes down in history as a man who kept Trump out of the White House and had a decent term. If he, if he, if he loses this, he goes down as the guy who let Trump back in. And couldn't let go. And couldn't let go. And that's a sad, sad story. Well, listen, Ken McDonald, Lord McDonald, Lord McDonald of River Glaven, of Clay Next to Sea in the county of Norfolk. I used to work the Telegraph. I do all the full, tall titles. Yeah, 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 Thanks yeah. for joining us today on Chopper's Political Podcast. I tweet at Christopher Hope on X. What, what's your tweet? I handle? don't tweet, but I co-present Double Jeopardy, the Lord Politics Podcast. <laughs> That's a third plug. <laughs> That's enough. Right. So you've heard it. You heard it. You must tune in now to Double Jeopardy. Email me, chopper at gbnews.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, I know you have, please do tell your friends. And if you've really enjoyed it, please leave a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps other people to find it. Thank you to the brilliant team of GB News colleagues behind this podcast, Mick Booker, Jeff Marsh, Rebecca Ganoons, and George, George McMillan. And most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening and for Ken McDonald for generously giving us his time for this podcast. If you want more Chopper in your life, and who doesn't, catch me during the week on GB News, popping up with political news every so often, and at midday on Wednesdays when Parliament is sitting for PMQs Live. And keep up to date with all our best political reporting on our website, gbnews.com. Until next time, though, cheerio!